Thank you very much. And uh, this is my great pleasure. And I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Professor Alexei Maklakov. Uh, he's a professor of evolutionary biology and biogerontology at the University of East Anglia. Um, <clears throat> professor Maklakov uh, started uh, doing a lot of behavioral work on, on birds, Arabian bubblers, in the same system where Amot Sahabi worked. Then he moved on working on different systems. <clears throat> Spiders, for example, he and he travel, um, went to different places. He worked in, in Uppsala and in other universities. But now his main focus has become the, the evolution and evolution of aging, biology of aging, evolution of life histories, and also sexual selection. Um, he and his team studies biology of aging using uh, both uh, theoretical and empirical approaches and using a variety of modern experimental approaches. And also they, their studies include a lot of different organisms uh, from C. elegans to even to birds and humans. Currently he's managing different projects. Some of them are uh, funded by great funding organizations such as the uh, ERC. And um, now he's going to talk about one of the most important questions in evolutionary biology is uh, basically how aging evolves. And so with that, please welcome uh, Professor Maklakov. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, for this uh, nice introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Uh, to be here, at least virtually, and, and, and uh, to participate in your seminar series. So um, I'm going to talk today about aging, and the title of my talk is somewhat uh, mysterious, perhaps aging is early life inertia, but uh, hopefully uh, it will become less mysterious by the end uh, of uh, this presentation. Uh, the subtitle of uh, my talk, uh, Disentangling Life History Trade-offs Along the Lifetime of an Individual, perhaps uh, gives a, a clue as to what uh, I'm going to talk about. Okay, uh, so I like starting my uh, seminars about the evolution of aging with this classical quote from uh, George Williams, who uh, back in 1957, wrote uh, in his uh, uh, classical uh, paper in evolution that it is uh, indeed remarkable that after a seemingly miraculous feat of morphogenesis, a complex metazoan should be unable to perform the much simpler task of merely maintaining what is already formed. So uh, George Williams clearly thought that aging is uh, uh, an exciting and an unexplained or at least partially unexplained phenomenon that uh, we really need to focus on. And so why indeed a uh, complex metazoan is unable to uh, maintain what is already formed. So the evolutionary theory of aging uh, uh, provides us uh, with a rather straightforward answer to this question. And the reason being uh, that the force of natural selection on traits declines with age. Right? There's, a, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, debate as to why it happens, but uh, I think there is a little debate uh, that it actually does happen. And this uh, decline of selection with age is what causes aging in uh, most organisms. Although, of course, we know that there's a great variation in uh, aging rates and there are, uh, there are some uh, suggestions uh, in the literature that certain organisms may not uh, age at all, which could be related to the fact that uh, the force of selection on traits does not decline in those uh, taxa. So, uh, this general underlying principle uh, of a decline of the force of natural selection with age leads to two uh, potential routes, uh, two quantitative genetic models that then can uh, explain how uh, aging evolves. Uh, so uh, if we look at this um, uh, 
uh, this cartoon uh, here, which plots uh, sort of survival, on, if you have survival on y-axis and age on x-axis. Essentially, uh, it shows us uh, the general idea that survival um, uh, survival in nature uh, is probably subject to a lot of what we call extrinsic or ecological or environmental mortality. So animals in nature often die from causes such as uh, predation, competition, parasitism, uh, all uh, different pathogens, accidents, right? Uh, all uh, different, all sorts of uh, extrinsic mortality. And because of this extrinsic environmental mortality, uh, if we start with a cohort of uh, 100 individuals, after a certain period of time, uh, obviously this cohort will decline to essentially zero. And the main idea is that very late in life, right, when there are very, very few individuals uh, from this initial cohort are alive, the mutations, right, the, the germline mutations whose effects on fitness are concentrated in late life, as shown here uh, in this downward facing red arrows. So such mutations can start to accumulate in the population, and this will result in the evolution of aging via the classical mutation accumulation route, as suggested by Peter Medawar in 1952. Now, uh, if we uh, um, if we can easily uh, see how aging may evolve via mutation accumulation route, it is perhaps even easier to see how it can evolve via antagonistic pleiotropy. So antagonistic pleiotropy refers to the situation where uh, alleles again have age-specific effects on fitness, but in this case, the effect is positive early in life but there is a catch, uh, there is a cost, and there is a, a detrimental effect on fitness later in life, right? So there is, uh, there is a genetic trade-off. Uh, such alleles can essentially be beneficial because they uh, may increase uh, fitness uh, of the organism, and such alle alleles uh, may not just accumulate on, in the population, but they uh, may simply be selected for, and they can go to fixation. Uh, so uh, aging uh, evolves because the force of selection on traits declines with age via either the accumulation of mutations with late acting deleterious effects or the antagonistic pleiotropy uh, selection for alleles that increase fitness uh, in early life at the expense of fitness late in life. <clears throat> okay, so this is a general action into our understanding of uh, uh, the, the evolutionary theory of aging and of how aging evolves. But of course, we want to know more. We want to connect our understanding of the quantity of genetics with more physiological, more uh, mechanistic, more proximate explanations of aging. And uh, on this slide, uh, I focus on antagonistic pleiotropy. And um, generally uh, in this slide, we group uh, different physiological explanations, different physiological theories into, into these two uh, two categories that we call rhesus allocation or early life inertia. So this is a link to the uh, title talk. Now, uh, perhaps the most well-known and the most studied and the most debated uh, physiological theory of aging based on the rhesus allocation principle is the disposable soma theory of aging. Although there are other models such as reduced risk of early life mortality. Uh, both of these models were uh, suggested initially by uh, Tom Kirkwood. Uh, the other group of theories, the early life inertia theories, uh, called in the literature, there are different names. Sometimes they're called developmental theory of aging, sometimes programmatic theory of aging, sometimes hyperfunction. Uh, these ideas are put forward by uh, different researchers uh, coming from different uh, fields and subfields. And they mean slightly different things and they uh, 
uh, sort of take uh, different angles uh, if you wish but broadly speaking there is a, this same general underlying idea so um, let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the disposable sum of theory first um, this is again um, a cartoon uh, which comes from uh, a paper by uh, Tom Kirkwood himself so uh, hopefully this cartoon represents reasonably well uh, how uh, he himself sees uh, the evolution of aging via disposable soma we have energy uh, resources uh, that can be allocated either towards maintenance and repair or towards growth and reproduction depending on where you allocate more resources you will have uh, either more maintenance and longer lifespan or less maintenance and shorter lifespan but uh, improved reproduction right so this is the uh, allocation model based on whether you put resources into reproduction and growth on one hand or somatic maintenance and survival on the other hand so um going back to our uh to our general slide uh, the key mechanism behind all resource allocation theories is the fact that there are insufficient resources in nature so when uh uh, species evolve under natural conditions they generally uh, face insufficient resources and so they evolve the optimal allocation of these resources uh, to these key life history traits resulting in insufficient repair and slow gradual accumulation of damage uh, of cellular damage which then uh, leads to aging so going back to this idea of antagonistic pleiotropy and, and, and we can clearly see right that the disposable soma is uh, a physiological theory which falls under the more general bracket of antagonistic pleiotropy because of course uh, this process of resource allocation is governed by genes right and, and if there are alleles that uh, affect the allocation of resources between uh, reproduction and survival uh, these alleles uh, by definition antagonistically pleiotropic so disposable soma is a uh, physiological theory a special case of uh, antagonistic pleiotropy but of course uh, it's not the only way uh, if we go back to uh, Williams's original paper and uh, uh, look at it carefully we will see that uh, Williams provided a very interesting abstract example of how aging may evolve the antagonistic pleiotropy. And that uh, example did not include resource allocation at all. Uh, so uh, Williams said, well, imagine that you have an allele that is uh, playing an important role in uh, such physiological processes as bone calcification and early in life uh, of, of this organism that requires bone growth obviously it's very important uh, the expression is uh, at a particular level uh, later in life the same level of gene expression uh, of, of this allele that in, is involved in bone calcification may actually become detrimental and may lead to for example uh, calcification of arteries and uh, aging and death later in life right so of course the idea is that natural selection will then act to uh, modify uh, gene expression in an age specific manner and we know of course that a lot of genes probably most of the genes uh, are expressed differently at different ages but then again if you remember the general principle that the force of natural selection on traits declines with age the idea then is that natural selection may not be able to fully optimize and fully remove all the detrimental effects of such an allele late in life because the selection on uh, the gene expression on the modification of on the age specific modification of gene expression will not be sufficiently strong right so this was the abstract example that williams gave uh, for how an antagonistically pleiotropic allele can act now uh, since then uh, a number of different uh, people uh, developed this uh, these ideas further i 
very much recommend uh, this paper by uh, Pedro Magalhães and your church, uh, 2005, where they developed these ideas in the framework of the developmental theory of aging. Essentially, uh, the gist of this idea is that, uh, again, the, there is a very strong selection on gene expression during development, uh, because unless the organism develops, matures, and starts to reproduce, um, obviously such an organism does not uh, necessarily contribute its gene to the uh, uh, future generation pool. So selection is expected to be maximal during this uh, uh, period, this part of life cycle, and is also expected to decline after the age of first reproduction. So the selection on what's happening early in life will be very strong. The selection will then decline and some physiological process that uh, uh, perhaps are running too high or too low following this developmental program may start causing uh, problems late in life and may directly contribute to aging. Uh, but selection against them will be only as strong as is necessary under the ecological circumstances for the particular uh, population in question. So uh, again, going back to our general slide, the idea behind this uh, bunch of different theories is that uh, there is simply insufficient selection on what's happening late in life, and as a result, there is an insufficient regulation of gene expression. It is not uh, linked uh, directly to uh, rhesus allocation trade-offs. Um, okay, so uh, this was a, a very long, but uh, uh, my views of a somewhat necessary introduction to uh, the work that we have been doing. And I will continue now uh, with first uh, introducing this uh, classical uh, study by Dylan et al. Uh, of science in 2002, which uh, provides some of the very nice examples, perhaps one of the uh, uh, most interesting tests so far of uh, whether uh, antagonistically pleiotropic uh, alleles uh, in, are involved in rhesus allocation or whether they are not involved in rhesus allocation. So this study has been done on C. elegans nematodes. Uh, and what they did was to, they uh, down-regulated insulin signaling pathway, which is one of the classical nutrient sensing signaling pathways. It's a pathway that, uh, uh, takes in the information from the environment, the information about nutrient availability, but not only, it's, it's a very uh, uh, broad, uh, broad pathway. I will talk about this a little bit uh, further on. Uh, and then integrates this information uh, to many downstream physiological processes. It may upregulate reproduction or downregulate reproduction. It may upregulate stress resistance or downregulate stress resistance. So. Uh, this pathway uh, is obviously a very good candidate for uh, uh, a signaling pathway that essentially allows organisms to uh, react adapt in an adaptive way to uh, changes in their environment. And so uh, we can down-regulate this pathway in C. elegans, for example, by uh, knocking down, right, uh, so silencing the expression of a DAF2 receptor, which is an upstream receptor. And if we do this using RNA interference, RNAi technique, uh, we can downregulate uh, the expression uh, strongly in our lab, for example. When we do this, uh, it generally downregulates the expression by around 50%. So if we do this early in life, right? If we do this early in the life of a nematode from uh, the egg, essentially from before the nematode is born, uh, the organism is born into this environment and uh, the expression of DAF2 and uh, the whole insulin pathway are down-regulated from the very, very beginning. That probably represents the situation uh, for the, what, what you would expect if you would have a, a DAF2 mutant, for example, right? So these, first of all, what you see is that these uh, nematodes are exceptionally long-lived, right? They, they live almost double uh, 
right? So, so the lifespan is almost doubled compared to the control uh, worms to, compared to the wild type. But there's a cost, right? So they live much longer, but their reproduction is quite reduced, in particular early in life. And generally, you can see that there is a, a, quite a substantial cost. And this cost continues to be present if we knock down DAF2 during the, the different stages of development, right? The, uh, the first, the second, the third, the fourth larval stages. So we have an extension of lifespan, but there is a cost, although the cost uh, appears to become sort of smaller um, with the age of a nematode. Now, the most interesting finding from my perspective was that if we knock down uh, DAF2 at day one of adulthood, which means post-development, we still have a massive lifespan extension. This is quite considerable effect size, as you can see, but there are uh, no costs of reproduction, right? Same happens on day two, for example. Essentially, we can allow the organisms to develop uh, and, and, and mature normally. We knock down DAF2 in adulthood, and we still have the same, uh, the same lifespan extension, but there is no cost of reproduction. So this is obviously a very exciting finding. Uh, evolutionary biologists, evolutionary ecologists, uh, obviously familiar with uh, much of this work, we're obviously asking a question such as, what are the potential trade-offs if these organisms encounter uh, other problems? Uh, what about the quality of these offspring? Right? What about the quality of these eggs? We, we're obviously very well aware of the uh, offspring uh, size, uh, offspring number trade-off, uh, and what would happen in more natural environments that are more stressful and more variable uh, than uh, laboratory conditions. So uh, we started to look into this uh, some time ago. One of the first things that we looked at was um, uh, the quality of the offspring. Uh, in this particular study led by uh, Martin Lind, who uh, now uh, leads his own lab in uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. So Martin um, essentially knocked down DAF2 in uh, day one, uh, in day one, uh, C. elegans, um, just as uh, in, in the study that we saw on the previous slide. In, uh, in this work, he also did this in three different strains, so in the wild type, and also in two strains, uh, PW1 and RF1, uh, where RNAi is somewhat deficient. Uh, Right, so uh, in RF1, the strain, the RNAi is generally deficient in the soma, while in this um, W is generally uh, mutant, is generally deficient in the germline. And so the first thing that Martin saw was that, yes, we can uh, uh, easily replicate the original finding, and our wild type worms were exceptionally long lived. Uh, you know, the, the, the wild type worms uh, live just over 20 days, uh, but if you knock down DAF2, they live up to almost 60 days. So again, a very large effect. Uh, the effect size is similar in, um, in this BPW1 mutant. Uh, it is also present and significant, but somewhat uh, smaller in RRF1 mutant, suggesting that um, uh, sort of knocking down, uh, knocking down DAF2 uh, is very important in uh, somatic tissues, although there is still uh, quite a, a large effect present. The main thing that we were interested in was this, right? The effect on uh, offspring, in particular not string fitness. There was no effect on uh, sort of reproduction, uh, just as in Dylan et al. paper. So uh, there is no detriment and there is no positive effect there. But if we look at fitness of the resulting offspring across these three different genetic backgrounds, essentially we found absolutely no evidence that there is a cost of reproduction, sort of hiding in, uh, in, in offspring quality. 
what we actually found was that there was a, a small increase in, in offspring fitness, right? So which was uh, quite interesting and surprising and, and somewhat unexpected, right? We didn't expect to find a positive effect of parental uh, daft RNAi on uh, fitness of the resulting offspring. But total reproduction and also individual fitness, uh, uh, if we calculate lambda, right, the individual uh, growth rate uh, is higher for uh, the offspring of uh, daft RNAi parents. So, um, okay, no cost uh, and perhaps even a benefit of uh, the parental daft RNAi uh, in the offspring. But uh, as uh, so I mentioned earlier, and as people in our field are very well aware of, uh, we need to take into account other potential trade-offs, right? Uh, different stresses that the organs can encounter. Maybe uh, knocking down DAF2 and down-regulating insulin signaling uh, results in cost-free lifespan extension in the benign laboratory conditions. But what about non-benign conditions? What about the conditions that are stressful? What about the conditions that are less predictable, right? That, that, that are variable. And uh, this is uh, in particular, this is particularly interesting because uh, as pointed out in this very nice and highly recommended review by Regan et al, uh, published in Functional Ecology in 2020, uh, IS TOR, right, this sort of insulin signaling target of rapamycin, this broad nutrient sensing signaling network is not quite nutrient sensing. It is much broader than that. Uh, uh, these pathways accumulate information about all these very important, very different um, factors in the environment. And then they integrate this information into uh, a range of key physiological responses that will then uh, affect uh, aging and lifespan, right? So um, based on that, um, uh, you could imagine, uh, as uh, was sort of suggested also uh, in the Regan et al. review, that maybe if we interfere with the function of this all-important pathway, under variable and complex natural uh, conditions, we then will see a cost. Uh, of course, um, an alternative hypothesis, perhaps based on these uh, early life inertia ideas, is that, okay, maybe we still won't find the cost because um, essentially what's, you know, the, the, the important part is when these uh, when we knock down these genes, and again, if we do it early in life, it may interfere uh, with important aspects of development, and there will be a cost. But if we allow the organisms to mature and reach early adulthood, we won't see uh, a cost altogether, also under these conditions. And so, uh, this is what we uh, aim to do, and we created this. Uh, uh, a kind of a variable environment. Uh, this is the first approach, so it's not in nature, it is still in the laboratory, but we can use uh, programmable chambers where we can regulate temperature for the period humidity. Uh, so in this particular case, we created uh, an environment where we uh, replicated something that we believe is representative of a uh, let's say a warm day uh, in summer in England, and um, uh, the wild type strain of C. elegans comes from Bristol. So uh, that's quite reasonable. Uh, so in our, in our experiment, we had night, right, at about 15 degrees and it's dark. Uh, then the lights come up in the morning and the temperature slowly goes up to 20 degrees. Late in the middle of the day, the lights increase in intensity, the temperature goes up to 25 degrees, back to 20 and lower light uh, in the evening and goes back uh, into the night. So the, the, we also, we, while we normally control humidity in the laboratory, in this uh, experiment, we let it go. 
and we let humidity fluctuate wildly uh, depending on uh, the light and temperature. So the idea was that it's a multivariate stress for the worms to deal with. There is some temporal variation and uh, this is ecologically uh, relevant, right? So what did we find? <clears throat> well, first of all, um, so this graph on the right hand side uh, just shows a uh, reduction in gene expression. Uh, each dot actually represents a single, uh, a single uh, worm, a single nematode. Uh, I personally find it very interesting that there's so much individual variation in DAF2 expression, right, naturally. Uh, this is something we should always keep in mind uh, when we do these types of experiments. Uh, but uh, following uh, our uh, uh, RNAi uh, procedure, we had about 50% uh, reduction uh, in expression. And how did it affect their survival under these conditions? So the survival is plotted here. Uh, and I will explain this uh, graph a little bit. So first of all, uh, as you can see, all plots uh, it says on top, matricide included, matricide excluded. Well, this is because um, in nematodes, when they think that the conditions are bad, they sometimes choose to do this. Um, uh, so it is a kind of a terminal investment strategy where essentially the, the young uh, hatch inside the, the, the maternal hermaphrodite and it's uh, good for the young, improves their survival, but obviously that's the end of the hermaphrodite. In biogenetological studies, such uh, matricidal deaths are normally uh, censored when uh, people present the survival plots. But uh, when we ask evolutionary biology questions, I think it's important to, to consider those as well. So we essentially plotted all the data in both ways, when matricide is included or excluded. But as you can see, essentially, uh, in this particular experiment, it didn't really change anything. And, and qualitatively, all the plots look very similar. OK, so um, the second thing is there are plots from three different experiments here, which is called ABC. And it explains here on uh, sort of along the y-axis what it stands for. So in the first experiment, we knock down DAF2 early in life, right, from, from uh, the egg, essentially. In the second experiment, we knock down DAF2 from adulthood, right, from early adulthood. And in the third experiment, we again knock down DAF2 from adulthood, but we also allow the worms to, to develop under normal kind of non-variable and non-stressful conditions. So the experiment C is somewhat closer to the uh, normal laboratory situation, I would say. So the first thing that I want you to pay attention to is that uh, generally, uh, DAFTA and EI extends lifespan considerably, right? Uh, also under these conditions in parents. There's absolutely no effect on the offspring, right? For each, for each experiment, we have data on parents here, and we have data on the offspring below. So parental lifespan is extended, offspring lifespan is not extended, and this is the case all the way through across all three experiments. Uh, the effect size of lifespan extension perhaps differs somewhat, but uh, there are no sort of significant differences here. So essentially, this is all pretty similar, right? The, um, by how much lifespan is extended. One thing to notice is that, of course, uh, uh, under these conditions, a lifespan of nematodes is uh, severely reduced compared to benign laboratory conditions. So wild type survives only for around 12, uh, 10 to 12 days. And of course, this is something to be expected. These conditions are quite stressful. Uh, and of course, the lifespan extension, the effect size is uh, perhaps smaller than what we see um, uh, in benign laboratory conditions. And it is mostly limited to late life, right? So the curves are quite similar in the beginning and they only start to diverge uh, later in life. Okay, so uh, one thing that people sometimes uh, uh, also ask is, okay, well, this is lifespan, but how do they uh, 
feel if you wish right so we, we sort of there, there's a very important uh parameter in biogeontology that people uh, really want to have some data on it's something called health span right rather than lifespan so essentially whether they're still in the good physiological condition and obviously we cannot ask the nematodes how they feel uh, one of the classical ways of assessing health span the nematodes is using locomotion and uh, we film them and we have a program which then uh, essentially uh, follows individual nematodes and gives us a lot of information uh, about whatever we want to know about their movement turns uh, and we can use it to calculate speed and this is what we have done and broadly speaking uh, we can see that not only lifespan is extended but also uh, the movements for example speed or the number of turns is also improved right uh, although there is of course a lot of variation but broadly speaking there is an improvement in how much the nematodes can move late in life so they, they're not <clears throat> they're not just living longer they are also uh, in the better physiological uh, condition so it seems okay <clears throat> although there is quite a lot of variation so for example in this particular experiment experiment c uh, you can see that there is a, a substantial lifespan extension right but there doesn't seem to be uh, <clears throat> there doesn't seem to be any uh, positive effect on uh, speed or 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 turns late in life <clears throat> okay so uh, what about what about reproduction, uh, age specific reproduction, and total reproduction? And we obviously estimated all that. This was one of our, this was one of the main reasons for uh, essentially conducting this experiment. Uh, we need to know how they reproduce uh, in total and how reproduction is, uh, <clears throat> how how the how the curve the, uh, the curve of reproductive performance uh, looks like uh, across different days. So the first thing we can see is that uh, there is, if we knock down DAF2 uh, uh, in early life, there is a cost, uh, even though the, the shape of the reproduct uh, of the of this curve is quite different from what we normally see under benign laboratory conditions, it is quite protracted and the peak uh, reproductive peak is quite much later in life. But uh, there is quite a clear cost. Uh, you can see it on this age-specific reproduction plot or in this total <clears throat> uh, lifetime reproductive success. And uh, you can also use this data again to calculate uh, lambda uh, individual fitness and the result is the same. So there is a cost <clears throat> uh, under these uh, variable, uh, variable conditions. What about uh, if we skip the development and, and do it just, uh, late, just in early adulthood? There is no cost. Uh, you can see, so these are the age-specific reproduction plots. And these are <clears throat> the total reproduction plots. Uh, there's, no, there's no benefit and there's no cost. Uh, this is what we see. Also, if we look at offspring fitness, uh, there is no benefit which is different from what we saw in uh, the benign laboratory conditions, but there's also no cost. Uh, quite interestingly, in this experiment, the third one, the experiment C, where we allow offspring to develop under these normal benign laboratory conditions, and we only introduce all this stressful complexity uh, from adulthood. So first of all, the reproduction curves here look much more like what we see normally. That's how they look like on the benign laboratory conditions that standard curve uh, and quite interestingly for the offspring even though the effect is minuscule but it is actually still uh, statistically significant and there is even a slight benefit here under these conditions remember so this experiment is closest to what we have done previously under the benign laboratory conditions but it seems that when conditions become more stressful and more variable uh, there is no benefit, it disappears, but there is also, importantly, no cost. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this essentially, uh, this was uh, the main thing that I wanted to show you today, and uh, this uh, slide summarizes our uh, findings up until now. Uh, 
we generally suggest that uh, these results show that the effects of reduced insulin signaling on reproduction and lifespan can be uncoupled in variable and stressful environments, uh, which then obviously um, suggests that uh, this insufficient regulation of gene expression in late life is perhaps the main reason for uh, aging, uh, at least in C. elegans uh, nematodes. But uh, I do want to use this opportunity to show you uh, uh, a, bit, a bit more, and we still have some time, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it will be interesting. All right, uh, the very last thing that I also want to mention is that while Williams and Medor, uh, uh, who are right, the two evolutionary biologists who came up with the our classical uh, mutation accumulation antagonistic plasma theories mostly talked about many small effect genes. Uh, what we see uh, in the field of biogeontology in the last uh, couple of decades is that uh, adjusting just very few key regulatory genes, for example, in uh, insulin signaling target of rapamycin pathway, can have very major effects on uh, aging and longevity. It's also an interesting point and worth remembering. Okay, so um, I, as I said, so one of the most interesting things is what would happen with all this stuff uh, in nature, right? And, and what I showed you so far uh, is our attempt to simulate nature in the laboratory. And of course, you can say, well, yes, you can only go thus far. Uh, uh, you cannot really truly replicate nature in the lab, and that uh, probably is uh, true. So we are now in the process of uh, developing a system that will hopefully allow us to do this in nature, at least uh, in some way. So this is our uh, campus at the University of East Anglia. Our, our lab is located somewhere here. I don't know if you can see my cursor on the slide. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, greenery around the uh, forest, and we even have a small lake, and uh, we actually can uh, find a nice uh, facility, which is under lock and key, we, we, where, we can run, where we can run our experiments in nature. And here you can see uh, Hannah Carlson, uh, our laboratory manager and uh, research associate who is in the process of conducting one of the first pilot experiments um, in this direction. So um, we can't we can't knock down uh, DAF2 directly in nature, of course. So the one of the first things we've done was to see what happens if we put worms uh, on DAFT RNAi for just 24 hours, and then we remove them from this DAFT RNAi after uh, 20. Well, we remove them from DAFT RNAi after 24 hours, and then measure gene expression 24 hours later, right? 48 hours in total. So the first thing we found was that. Uh, essentially, gene expression goes back to normal levels, uh, and there's absolutely no difference uh, 24 hours after removal. Although there's quite a lot of variation here. This is essentially the first block. In the second block, there was a bit of a difference. So I would say currently, what we know is that uh, the effect of the RNAi on gene expression declines quite strongly. Uh, 24 hours later, the difference is probably around 10% on average. Uh, we're still in the process of checking all that, but we clearly know that it declines very rapidly and uh, essentially uh, disappears uh, completely at some point. But despite the fact that uh, if we put them on RNAi for a short period of time rather than for the whole life, the, the actual effect on gene expression seems to uh, go away quite quickly. The phenotypic effect uh, lingers on, and it is still quite strong. The data that I'm showing you now, uh, please bear in mind, this is all very pre preliminary pilot data, essentially some first blocks of, of uh, what hopefully will be a, a long-term project. 
But essentially, uh, if we look here, so this uh, survival curve is a control line, right? This survival curve on top is normal daft RNAi. When we put worms on daft RNAi day one and keep them constantly on daft RNAi. And there is a bunch of curves here in between, which is when we put the worms on daft RNAi for just 24 hours, either the first larval stage or day one, two, three, four of adulthood. And what we can see here, uh, there was no effect if we do it uh, very early in life. But if we do it at the adult stage, there is quite substantial phenotypic effect. Uh, there's quite substantial lifespan extension still. Uh, there's some indication it may decline with the age. Again, uh, take it with sort of two pinches of salt. It's all preliminary uh, pilot data that is in the process of uh, being collected. Um, <clears throat> So we know uh, essentially that we can put worms on daft RNAi for a very short period of time, remove them from daft RNAi, the actual RNAi effect within the worm disappears completely, probably 48 hours later, but there is a lingering phenotypic effect uh, of lifespan extension. And we use this idea to then test, like if we take these worms that were pre-treated uh, with doctor for a short period of time, uh, even though there's no uh, RNAi, in, there's no effect uh, any longer, sort of because we, we took them off uh, the um, doctor RNA inducing bacteria, but we can still take them outside, put them into uh, different replicate uh, sort of population cages. Uh, essentially, what we do, we have compost, which is very good for nematodes. We bring in, bring it in. We autoclave it so it's clean. Then we re-inoculate this with bacteria. We put fixed number of our worms uh, into these populations. These populations are isolated from the environment by uh, a malt of uh, salt water, and they're also covered with uh, chicken wire mesh so that larger organisms cannot get in and destroy it. And then we can use uh, this uh, approach to actually estimate population growth rate in nature. And this is what we're uh, currently trying to do. Again, uh, this is just some very, very preliminary findings from pilot studies that we're conducting to see just how it all works. But it's all very encouraging. It does work. We can go on and uh, sample our nematodes afterwards. So these are samples taken 10 days after the population start. And these are samples 17 days. Obviously, this is several generations in, when it comes to worms. We can see that essentially we don't have much of a difference here. Uh, again, uh, initial studies, uh, it's all very pilot, but we currently don't see any obvious cost uh, of daft RNAi uh, on population growth rate, even under essentially natural conditions outside. And obviously we're gonna continue this and do this in different times of the year, different seasons. This has been done in August, and uh, so we'll see how that uh, works out. This is some work in progress. Okay, uh, so I think I will uh, generally stop here. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, our conclusion slide. Uh, based on what we know so far, I think, based on what we know from experiments conducted on the benign laboratory conditions, and experiments conducted under stressful and variable conditions in the laboratory that tried to mimic nature, and even some pilot results from more kind of real natural environment, natural world. It seems that uh, reducing insulin signaling uh, in adulthood, right, increases survival, but this increase does not translate into increased fitness or decreased fitness in variable environments, which essentially to me suggests that uh, there would be very little selection on the expression, on age-specific expression of DAF2 in these animals under natural conditions. Uh, 
And if that's correct, that of course is very much in line with this idea of aging as early life inertia, which essentially is based on uh, insufficient selection, resulting in insufficient regulation of gene expression in late life. And uh, I will finish by first of all acknowledging people who contributed to this work. Uh, Hannah Carlson, uh, who is behind much of this work and who is currently uh, conducting, I mean, she, she was, she led the sort of um, Nature in the Lab project that is now published and she's now developing uh, this system where we hopefully will be able to try out things uh, in an, even in a more natural environment outdoors. Uh, Liz Duxbury and Ed uh, McCook, uh, the postdocs in my lab, who contributed immensely to all of, to this work, conducting molecular uh, molecular analysis and uh, statistical analysis. Nathan and uh, Nathan Ed and Chris Sales, uh, two technicians on this project, who collected a lot of very important data. Uh, Martin Lind and San, uh, Sanjana Ravindran, uh, uh, we worked together back in Uppsala. Uh, they uh, essentially led on the project where we were looking at the effects of parental DAFTA in the eye on offspring fitness. And our funders and you for listening, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much again. And one of the downside, yeah, exactly, uh, that I was going to say, uh, Mark just illustrates it, that uh, you cannot hear the clapping, but we're all clapping. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, now we, we can have uh, questions. <clears throat> Do we have any questions? Sure, I can ask a question. Uh, thank you so much. That was, that was a really uh, amazing tour de force. And so I was really um, excited about your conclusion that a few genes of, of strong effects rather than, you know, multiple genes of small effects, you know, seem to, to pay attention or play, or play a role here. Um, my question is, why can't we fix those genes then? You know, it, it, it would be... Uh, you know, it would be an easy thing to target selection on those genes, you know, and uh, instead of, you know, having to deal with lots of small genes or, just, or other genes with small effects. Yeah, so that is an excellent question. And I guess this is something that uh, uh, I think a lot, quite a lot of people are interested in, in uh, modeling these effects. And I guess in the end of the day, what we need is uh, we need some formal models to connect uh, quantitative genetic theories like antagonistic pleiotropy with more uh, physiological theories such as uh, developmental theory of aging and disposable soma. Um, so the, the, the sort of broadest, the qualitative answer is simple. I guess the idea is that there is no selection to do it, right? Uh, we can say we know that it's possible to fix because we have uh, long-lived organisms and short-lived organisms, and we, we know that we can even sort of select, we can select on lifespan, we can select on aging, uh, and quite rapidly we can have uh, relatively strong effects. Uh, in this system, my argument, I guess what we're trying to show so far is that, so there is this pathway that regulates, seems to regulate everything, and uh, if you interfere with it, it's very important. So if you interfere with the function of this pathway, like if you have a mutant, like a DAF2 mutant, this mutant is going to lose out because uh, it will have a lot of problems in development. It will develop slower. It will be more likely to go into dour state when there is no need to do so. It will have lower fecundity probably early in life. So it will, it will have really a lot of problems. So you don't want to be sort of a DAF2 mutant. You need what you need uh, is the evolution of a, a modifier that will modify the expression of DAF2 in an age specific manner. But for some of us to evolve, you need a reason. And our data so far shows that there is no reason because, uh, you know, knocking down DAF2 doesn't seem to improve uh, fitness under stressful environments, under variable environments. What it seems to improve is kind of post-reproductive survival, right? 
uh, which is possibly you know not, not not particularly important in the life cycle of of these animals uh -huh. sure. so this this is essentially our answer it's possible to do but na because natural selection is not particularly interested in how long these nematodes will live uh, when they're already very old and sort of post reproductive so there's very very little selection for something like this to happen thank you so much that's an interesting <clears throat> concept, um, but there are obviously a, a lot of other animals that um, might reproduce several times and where the, the post-reproduction period might be a, a target for selection. And for example, if you just take the, the, um, the example of humans, selection was, uh, was able to, to, um, to generate menopause in, in, in females, in elderly um, females. So, why isn't there a possibility for an age-specific regulation of these target uh, mechanisms later in life? So not, not messing with the, the development and the early life part, but just down-regulating them later in life. Yeah, so I think, so the way I see it is, so I guess the answer is that there is such a mechanism and exactly, exactly the thing you mentioned that uh, we know you know, if if uh, if the ecological conditions for a particular taxon, right, whether it's humans or or whales or naked mole rats, right, where the ecological conditions are such that they favor uh, slow aging, long life, there's strong selection of happen what what's going to happen late in life. There is an evolution of. Uh, uh, gene expression in these nutrient sensing signaling pathways uh, in a way that promotes uh, late life fitness. And well, you know, we can, uh, um, um, we also know that we can run uh, experimental evolution studies or artificial selection studies with animals such as nematodes or drosophila, and we can relatively easily select for quite considerable uh, improvements in lifespan. Uh, it's, uh, I guess, an interesting question whether if we, if we would create a situation for C. elegans where it will be particularly beneficial to survive for a very, very long period of time, whether we would expect the evolution of even further modification of age-specific expression of DOF2, that's quite possible. I think that currently there is very little standing genetic variation for it because they they evolved to have a certain life cycle. From everything that we know about the ecology of C. elegans in nature, and we don't know very much, I think, but we know something. They have this boom and bust uh, reproduction cycle, right? So they often colonize a certain food patch and then they reproduce and the population growth uh, uh, is, 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 I know, probably exponential. And what happens early in life is very important. Perhaps the only important thing for a nematode is to survive, to be able to develop and to reproduce for one, two, three days. So that's what's going to contribute to its fitness. What happens afterwards is probably much less important. So the answer to your question, as perhaps to, to Mark's question previously, is the same. There's just not enough selection. In species where there is selection, we see that this selection essentially produces, uh, uh, pr produces phenotypes that uh, have uh, high fitness late in life. Okay, just thank you. the strength of selection. There is a, a, a question in the chat, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I can see it. Uh, said that knockdown of DOF2 reducing IS at early adult age can extend life without reducing fitness. Do you mean it can't affect even the late reproduction fitness of organisms? Or in a benefit point of view, can this extend life reproduction period as it increases the time of onset of aging. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to answer in some detail. So first of all, uh, most C. elegans live as self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. And so uh, 
their reproduction is then limited to the number of sperm that they can self-produce. Uh, so essentially there, again, it seems like um, they are adapted for uh, essentially reproducing themselves without mating with males because it's a very interesting system. It's a system with hermaphrodites and males, right? The hermaph hermaphrodites are self-fertilizing. They can mate with males, and then they will reproduce more and for longer. But males are extremely rare in the natural populations. Again, from what we know, it is probably something around 0.3% uh, 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 of males in the natural populations they are really really rare and they seem to be only produced under stressful conditions right so that when the, the conditions are fine it's very difficult to find any males if you want to find males in the laboratory you need to heat choke them or starve them or do something horrible to nematodes and then they start producing males so their normal reproduction doesn't include mating so it seems uh if they mate it is a very interesting question how knocking down DAF2, how reducing IS will affect this. We are actually looking into this now. Uh, I don't want to sort of uh, jump the gun. So people have worked on this before and published some interesting, very interesting results. There are some studies based on mutants, right? DAF2 mutants that suggest that actually uh, the late life fertility is uh, disadvantage. So there's a disadvantage. Right, so that could be interpreted as one of the costs of, of uh, reducing this insulin pathway. But we, yeah, I can't even sort of say very much more. We're looking into this now. It seems that the station is quite different if you, again, uh, focusing on, uh, on age-specific RNAi. And uh, we don't necessarily see uh, a cost uh, there may even be some beneficial effects that sort of would require further work, uh, I think. But uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, so there's another question in the chat. Yeah, I think it's uh, social mammalian species like elephants uh, or uh, orcas or even humans. The post-reproductive of elder or females can be important for the survival of younger group members right um yeah so that that obviously is a very interesting uh question and uh sort of there isn't until uh so first of all yes absolutely in in um species where you have extended parental care and grandparental care uh there would be selection uh there's a possibility for selection on, on survival and late life, uh, even for the individuals who do not reproduce uh, because they contribute, uh, they contribute via parental, grandparental care. Uh, in C. elegans, uh, I would say until very recently, there was no evidence for any form of care whatsoever. However, this seems to be changing very rapidly and there are some interesting indications that it is possible that older uh, older individuals somehow contribute to the nourishment of the younger individuals although whether it's under selection or whether it's just a byproduct of uh, the fact that they die and disintegrate and then the young can actually feed on the remains that remains to be seen i think that is not clear at all and, and i'm sure there will be a lot of work into this but yeah, so C. elegans, I would say until recently, were not the great study organism to, for something like this, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe C. elegans are a great study organism for everything, including uh, parental care. <clears throat> mm. Okay, thank you for the questions. Yes, I think. Uh, yeah, I think I don't see any more questions in chat. I, I have a, an, uh, another question related to Mark's question and my own. Um, so that if we assume that aging is caused by a few pathways, physiological pathways, signaling pathways with great effect, then the, the logical consequence is that 
pharmacologically you can fix that. And there are, there are um, a line of researchers who actually argue that you can fix. And some researchers uh, argue that aging basically in humans, I'm talking about humans now, aging is a disease that is a curable disease and you can, you can fix it and you can live forever. And some serious researchers um, <clears throat> propose this idea. And I would like to ask what's your opinion about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I guess that's already, uh, this is more, I guess this is all now very informal uh, as it is sort of outside the realm of uh, nematode longevity. Uh, yes, I see you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, uh, I think that the first part that uh, uh, aging can be uh, uh, modified pharmacologically, uh, this is, I, I think it's a very exciting idea, uh, which is likely to be correct to, to a degree. Uh, I just want to say something before that, that uh, I think aging is a very, very complex process. And what a lot of people are saying, including probably the, the scientists that you mentioned that say that this is all because of uh, you know few uh, regulatory pathways. And if we learn how to deal with these pathways, uh, we can improve things. Uh, I really wouldn't go as far as to say that we can live forever or even sort of dramatically uh, longer, but they, they can be uh, modified. That's quite likely. Uh, I think uh, one possibility, one thing that can happen is if you take an organism, perhaps even a nematode, and you uh, modify something uh, such as uh, you modify uh, insulin signaling and you cause them to live to maybe two and a half times longer than normal, they still die, right? They still age and die. So there are many other things that contribute to it. It, it, it is just possible that in nature, they commonly die from a certain process. And if we uh, fix sort of in parentheses this process and uh, cause them to live longer, then other problems that are currently hidden from the view will come into play and, 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 start, uh, and start causing problems, right? So uh, there's this difference, I guess, between what could be affecting uh, aging specifically in this species, in this environment, and all the other, and all the other things that are currently sort of hidden from the view. Uh, but I'm sure that we can, and I, and I guess we, we probably can use uh, this knowledge to, to, to tap into these pathways and to try to modify them at least to some degree uh, to our benefit, or at least so we can hope. All right, thank you. And it seems that we still have one, probably a final question in the, in the chat, if you can read this. Uh, yeah. Um, can the developmental theory of aging be addressed by phylogenetic comparative studies using developmental early life reproduction and aging data of several wild living species? Uh, um, yes, I, 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 I think I think it can. I think it, I guess we. Uh, one question is how how many sort of uh, wild living species, for how many wild living species we have good resolution data of uh, such questions. But uh, I'm sure we can, uh, so, so something can be learned from this. Uh, and there are also some interesting developments, uh, I guess, in recent year, years, year or two, uh, where we potentially soon will be able to maybe estimate uh, uh, age with some precision in wild populations using some uh, epigenetic markers. And wh while it is still quite unclear what it is exactly that we're estimating, but I'm sure this field will develop and mature, and we will be able to use some of these techniques to estimate age of animals in nature. And I think that will allow, uh, this will allow us to uh, gather much more data of this kind that can be used to test uh, some of these uh, theories. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. We have to conclude the, the session. Uh, thank you so much again for the amazing talk. Uh, for the, Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure and, and very interesting and, and great questions also, very, 
very relevant and, and very sort of uh, interesting question. So thank you everybody and then um, have a nice rest of your day and then see you see you next time. Thank and you. Alex, uh, hopefully we can we can uh, meet sometime in, in person as well. Next time maybe. Really, yeah, yeah. Be nice that would be very nice. Very follow up with this talk in, in person next time. All right, thank you much. Thank you very much sure. for the great talk. Thank and, you. And Thanks a lot. Bye.